Zion National Park is located in southwestern Utah. This small park covers an area of 600 square kilometers and is renowned for its deep canyons dug out by the Virgin River and its affluence from the colorful rock that is tens of millions of years old. path is open to visitors along the riverbank, and even within the shallow river itself. Along the path, you can appreciate the canyon's abrupt slopes and the river's glacial waters. The slope that follows the Virgin River, which belonged to the Colorado River Basin, varies between 0.9 and 1.5 percent within the park. This major drop-off, which is seen in deep canyons, accelerates the flow of water runoff. The soil in the area of the Zion Canyons is made up of nine superimposed geological formations that represent 150 million years of sedimentation. This pile of rocks, 3,000 meters thick, also formed in hot seas, lakes, deserts, and in coastal environments. Established as a national park in 1919, the park was named Zion, an ancient Hebrew word meaning refuge or sanctuary. Famous for its colorful landscapes and its imposing canyons, the park draws in more than two million visitors annually. It is the seventh most visited national park in the country. Still in southern Utah, Bryce Canyon National Park has a surface area of 145 square kilometers. It is renowned for its geological formations made up of colorful rocks that are dozens of millions of years old. The entire area belongs to the western part of the Colorado Plateau, famous for its eroded red rock. Bryce Canyon is located at a high altitude. Its peak tops out at 2,778 meters, and its lowest point at the level of the stream that runs at the bottom is at an altitude of 2,018 meters. The park is made up of elevated semi-arid areas and presents an ensemble of huge national amphitheaters dug out from the rock by erosion. The greatest among them, Bryce Canyon, measures nearly 20 kilometers long and 5 kilometers wide, at a depth of nearly 250 meters. A path widens along the upper edge, and many observation posts are present there. The region's geological history is marked by a lot of sediment deposit, stretching out over the course of 130 to 40 million years. Over time, the erosion of these sediments created the hoodoos, also called fairy chimneys. Hoodoos are a type of great natural column made of friable sedimentary rock, whose peaks are made of rocks that are more resistant to erosion. 
These strange, sometimes phallic shapes have given rise to many beliefs and legends. Here in Bryce Canyon, the hoodoos were considered as the petrified remains of ancient beings who had been punished for their bad actions. They are the park's emblems. Here, too, an ancient alluvial plain, or marine bottom, rose up under the movement of the tectonic plates and was then eroded by rainfall and water runoff. The resulting landscape looks like a lunar setting if it weren't for the conifers that dot the more gentle slopes. Besides creating the hoodoos, the plateau's erosion led to the formation of other geological structures called arches. The upper geological layer has, in certain areas, resisted erosion caused by rainfall. Only the lower layers have been destroyed. Very well known with its famous pigeons, the Piazza San Marco, surrounded on all sides by the Doge Palace, the Marciana Library, the Campanile and San Marco's Basilica, draws crowds of tourists and photographers throughout the year. In 828, St. Marco's Basilica was founded because the city wanted to change its patron saint to rival with Rome St. Peter. The Doge sent two Venetian merchants to steal the holy relics of St. Mark the Evangelist from a small chapel near Alexandria in Egypt. Mark had gone to the region in the first century AD to evangelize the people. The basilica and its domes were thus built to shelter the relics of the city's new patron saint with the lion as its symbol. Horses are also seen on the facade. Made of nearly pure golden copper, these horses hail from the racetrack of Constantinople, from where they were taken during the Crusades. They each weigh 875 kilos. While the facade's sumptuous decorations give an impression of immense luxury, the interior is no less luxurious. This church introduced the central dome in Italy, and this influenced a number of architects, from Michelangelo up to the present day. St. Mark is at home here. At the southern tip of the Grand Canal stands the Basilica Santa Maria della Salute, whose construction was decided upon by the Senate of Venice in 1630, while a plague epidemic raged on after decimating nearly a third of the population in two years. The architect Baldassare Longhena devoted 50 years of his life to the construction of this edifice. Of all Venetian constructions, this one rests on the greatest number of wooden piles. The edifice is supported by more than one million wooden piles. The architect designed the basilica in octagonal shape to evoke the crown dedicated to the Virgin. And the originality of its architecture resides in the great ears of these spiral volutes topped with statues. They ensure the transition between the facades and the dome topped by the patron saint. The monumental interior contains numerous artworks by Tintoretto and Titian. Painting of the Madonna with child is displayed in the choir above the altar. It's in the purest Byzantine style, a city Venice held dear, if only for the trade opportunities it offered to the Republic, 
who engaged in commerce with eastern countries. Canaraggio contains many churches, including the Madonna dell'Orto Church, which is one of the most beautiful. It was built in the 14th century and was first devoted to St. Christopher, the patron saint of travellers, before being dedicated to the Virgin Mary. The brick facade is decorated with white stones and the 12 apostles are clearly presented. The portal is decorated with fine Corinthian columns. Its campanile is topped by an oriental-style onion-shaped dome. The magnificent adjoining cloister is from the same era. The interior is made up of a central nave with arches supported by columns made of Greek marble. The pentagonal apse is decorated with paintings by Tintoretto, taught by the cardinal virtues. Along the central nave, the lateral corridors contain many beautiful altars made of coloured marble topped with statues. The Venetian artist Sima de Conegliano was another talented painter who worked here. His painting of St. John the Baptist is displayed here. Here, the story of St. Agnes is recounted in a painting by Tintoretto. The great Venetian master of mannerism recounted her miracle using his paintbrush. In fact, this great painter is buried in a chapel to the right of the choir. San Giorgio Maggiore, on one of the islands that make up Giudica, is an abbatial basilica that stands opposite San Marco's Square. Completed in the early 17th century, the church and its cloister support a campanile that rises 63 meters high and contains six bells. On its white stone facade, marble statues of St. George and St. Stephen are displayed. The church's interior, in the shape of a Latin cross, is divided into three naves whose lateral walls contain six chapels. Here too, Tintoretto created many works. He painted the crowning of the Virgin in one of these three lateral chapels. In another chapel, the torture of St. Lucy was painted by Leandro Bassano. The church is renowned for its choir topped by an organ dating from 1750. The artwork on the high altar is attributed to Aliense, painter who worked with Tintoretto. The sculptures were created by Gerolamo Campagna. They represent God on the terrestrial globe supported by the four evangelists. The sides of the altar are adorned with large paintings by Tintoretto. The one on the left represents the manor harvest, one of the most remarkable landscape paintings by the Venetian master. Manna is the sweet substance that seeps out of certain plants. It was used as food by the Hebrews as they crossed the desert to flee Egypt in search of the promised land. To the right, the Last Supper is one of the master's most famous paintings we can admire the play of light that the painter created by placing a lamp in the background. Behind the altar stands the Choir of Monks, a magnificent woodwork created by Alberto de Brule.
50 kilometers to the north of Manua, the city of Lyon was also a candidate to be the country's capital. Later, in the 19th century, the city established itself as the liberal capital of the country thanks to its university. And in the 20th century, the Nicaraguan Revolution established its headquarters there. Lyon is very proud of having been the first capital of the revolution. Today, the city jealously defends its title of university city and has developed its artistic and cultural excellence, as is evidenced by the numerous museums, exhibitions and churches that dot the urban landscape. In the middle of the Central Park, there stands a statue of Maximo Jerez, who is considered the greatest liberal political thinker in the history of Nicaragua. He was leader of the movement for a unified Central America in the 19th century. The lions at his feet are a gift from the president of the neighboring country, Guatemala. The statue stands proudly before the city's cathedral. This building is one of only two sites in the country that are classified as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. Originally built in 1610, then burnt down, then rebuilt in 1624, then burned down again and rebuilt again and again, the current cathedral is characterized by its eclecticism, showing a transition between the Baroque and neoclassical styles. Elevated to the rank of Basilica by Pope Pius IX, the building is distinguished by a rectangular layout with five naves and large pillars that support the vault. The interior decoration is particularly sober and the main nave enjoys great natural luminosity. The sanctuary of the tabernacle is, on the other hand, very richly decorated and contrasts with the general sobriety of the whole. Its centerpiece is a wooden Christ, saved from the destruction of the first church. Its spacious interior is interspersed on the aisles with numerous altars and chapels containing beautiful works of art, including these paintings of the 14 Stations of the Cross, made by Nicaraguan painter Antonio Saria at the beginning of the 20th century. Lyon's Basilica Cathedral has real historical value. Since 1531, it has been the seat of the first diocese of the Catholic Church in Nicaragua making it one of the oldest dioceses in America. It has also had a political value because this is where the resistance to the dictatorship was born and some of the nation's illustrious figures are buried here. They lie in crypts, their intent to resist earthquakes, because this is of course an anti seismic structure, which enables it to survive several earthquakes, as well as the 23 eruptions of the neighbouring volcano. Another remarkable church in the city, the Church of La Recollection, the Harvest, is remarkable for its height, its structure and its colour. Completed in 1785, the building has Mexican Baroque architecture, with twisting columns and stucco reliefs that evoke the Passion of the Christ. The intense yellow of its facade can be spotted from far away and makes the structure unique. The present Church of Calvary, built in 1810, is an architectural jewel declared a National Artistic Heritage Site. It's a typical facade with its fake red bricks bear witness to the French influence on the Hispanic colonial architecture of the time. You can make out the bar reliefs, entirely restored, that depict, here as well, the stage of the Passion of the Christ. The revolution and the struggle for independence against the dictatorship marked the country and still deeply marks the culture of Nicaragua, especially in the city of Lyon, the former nerve centre of the challenge to the Somozas, which ended with the assassination of the dictator in September 1956. The numerous works of street art and other murals, which are legion of the walls of the city, are testament to this culture of struggle. They sometimes depict the hero of the independence movement, a symbol of peace, or on the contrary, the violence of the old dictatorship. 
The church of Our Lady of La Merced was also destroyed during the Civil War, then burnt down by William Walker's men, before being completely restored, along with the tower, at the end of the 19th century. In the Americas, the Virgin of Mercy was considered a protector against volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and other damaging natural disasters. The nave is supported by columns made of single pieces of wood with decorative bases. It is extended by the main altar, where the statue of Our Lady of Mercy is worshipped. This statue was brought here to Lyon from Barcelona, in Spain by the Mercedarian brothers in the 18th century. Since then, every September the 24th, it has been displayed in the street of the city during a procession that generates a lot of fervor. Devotion to the Virgin of La Merced spread from Catalonia from the 13th century as a kind of religious chivalry. The Order of the Mercedarians then participated in the evangelization of America from the beginning, and this devotion spread and became deeply rooted throughout the American territory. The vault above the main altar is covered with frescoes, representing the patroness of the church. In a way, this cult of the compassionate virgin is linked with the spirit of the knights who went on crusades to the Holy Land to found communities around the churches that they built and many of the main colonial cities of Latin America were founded with the support of the Mercedarian brothers. The Municipal Theatre is one of the most important cultural stages in Lyon. It has been declared a national cultural heritage site and since its inauguration in 1885 has welcomed eminent representatives from Europe and South America in the fields of opera and theatre, including the famous poet Ruben Dario. In front of its brightly coloured facade, there are two bronze statues that are allegories for theatre, with a mask and music with a harp. Amongst the cultural highlights of the Austrian capital, Vienna's Museum of Art History is considered one of the premier museums of ancient art in the world. The purpose of this building was to be a museum from the time it was constructed in 1891 on the circular boulevard that goes around the city. Its facade imitates the style of the Italian Renaissance, and each year it receives more than 600,000 visitors, 75% of whom are foreigners. It was built not far from the Imperial Palace, so that it could accommodate the vast collections that Habsburgs had accumulated over the centuries. It was designed with a concentrated blend of neo-baroque decorative elements, and its interior is one of the most exquisite and festive known in the architecture of European museums. The entrance and its stairway are worthy of the wonders that are exhibited here. Upstairs, the hall has a dome that would make any royal or papal palace jealous. It's truly a declaration of imperial power. The museum presents a variety of unparalleled collections, ranging from antiquities to 18th century painting, with the Renaissance in between, and with numerous works by the masters of Northern Europe. In particular, the largest collection in the world of works by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Born around 1525, he represents one of the four peaks of Flemish painting, along with Jan van Eyck, Hieronymus Bosch, his spiritual father, and Peter Paul Rubens. Working in a completely different genre, Peter Paul Rubens only created major religious projects, important series of historical paintings and mythological paintings. 
master of the Dutch Golden Age in the 17th century, Johannes Vermeer only made 45 paintings and his fame was limited to his province. This painting that he never meant to sell shows him at work. The German painters were not to be outdone during the Renaissance. Albrecht Dürer also traveled several times to Italy. On his return to Germany, he became the German painter of the early Renaissance in the service of the emperor. His friend, Lucas Cranach the Elder, was also a court painter. His career oscillated between two styles, one quite Gothic, like the three sisters you see here, and the other Mannerist, inspired by the Baroque. Taken by Lutheran ideas, he participated in the creation of the Protestant iconography. In the Book of Judith, which the Protestants claim as their own, Judith decapitates General Holofernes, who is threatening Israel. But the Renaissance is already 100 years old in Italy, and its first period comes to an end. Giovanni Bellini, the precursor to the Venetian school of the High Renaissance, marked the definitive break with the Gothic. Raphael, after becoming a master painter, went to live in Florence, where he completed his training with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. This is when he painted his Madonna. Considered one of the greatest painters, the grace of his works is often contrasted to the violence of his rival Michelangelo. Jacopo Tintoretto represents Venetian mannerism in all its splendor. Like many painters, Tintoretto found support in the Bible. And here, he takes up the biblical theme of Susanna, the young, naive girl who two old men watch bathe. The painter shows his talent with his treatment of the dark, silvery light that illuminates the body of Susanna with crystal clarity. Caravaggio marks a breakthrough in art. By inventing chiaroscuro, he created a violence and drama that set a precedent. Gentileschi was Caravaggio's student before he fled Rome. Gentileschi was one of the main propagators of Caravaggism in Europe, his version of which had a softer light and realism. Spaniard Diego Velázquez mainly made portraits of the royal family. More than just a painter of the court, he was the painter of the king's chamber. Proof of this are these two paintings of the Infanta Margarita Teresa at two different ages. They were commissioned so that the Austrian prince, who had been engaged to marry her since her birth, could see her grow up. The Art History Museum of Vienna has a very beautiful collection. Its galleries of paintings house many major works of Western art, like the Madonna of the Meadow by Raphael, the Studio by Vermeer, the Portraits of the Infanta by Velasquez, and masterpieces by Bruegel, Rubens, Jura, Caravaggio, and Tintoretto. This collection is well established in the history of the Renaissance, which shaped this great city. The Museum of Art History opens onto a square into the center of which is a large statue of Empress Marie Theresa. The spouse of Emperor Francis I, she governed for 40 years after the death of her husband and was nicknamed the Great. The 44-ton bronze statue shows her as welcoming and authoritative. She was able to govern and preserve the empire with the help of her shrewd and faithful knights. Just across on the other side of the square, the Museum of Natural History is a replica of the Museum of Art History. It opened its doors at the same time and also houses an immense collection from the Habsburgs. Animals, insects, plants, precious stones. The museum houses around 30 million objects. 
Empress Sissi inaugurated the square and the two museums in 1888. Fewer than 200 kilometers south of Paris, between the cities of Amboise and Blois, a treasure of poetry is hidden. The Chateau of chaumont sur loire is perched on a promontory 40 meters above the last wild river in Europe. The estate was built by Pierre d'Amboise, a minister of King Louis XI, and modifications were made by his son Charles in the defensive Gothic style that is characteristic of castles from the end of the 15th century. Later, the chateau was the property of Catherine de Medici, Diane de Poitiers, and the Princess of Broglie. On the interior of the courtyard, the defensive style gives way to the Renaissance style imported from Italy. The bartisans, windows and sloping roofs, have a non-military architectural style and thus let the light in. It was King Charles II who finished the third stage of the work in the early 16th century. He was responsible for the great monumental staircase, which is on the interior, not the exterior, as it would have been in the Middle Ages. The width of the staircase is almost royal. It was forbidden for a lord to have a staircase that was wider than that of the kings. The size of the steps was calculated so that knights could go up them without their swords touching the steps. The central newel is sculpted with shells, in front of which candles were placed to light the staircase at night. The stained glass windows restored by the Prince and Princess of Broglie in the 19th century show the genealogies of the different owners of the chateau. Taking this majestic staircase to go up to the grand apartments, which are still located upstairs, you arrive in the guard room. This room was returned to its original arrangement by the Broglies in order to recall the medieval aspect of the chateau. The guards protected the chateau and its occupants, but they also protected the Lord's treasure locked away in this German-made safe that weighs 250 kilograms. The 20 lock bolts are synchronized with a single key, and there was a secret code for turning the key in several different directions. Above it, a 17th century tapestry from Goblin manufacture depicts the scene of a battle between the Athenians and the Persians. But then the era of the Counts of Amboise came to an end. With the death of Charles II, the family sold the chateau to the spouse of King Henry II, Catherine de Medici. She bought it privately and not as the Queen of France because it was a chateau that was very interesting on an economic level. Thanks to its lands and rights of way, she earned a lot of money from it. Her room was recreated in memory of the period when she lived there in 1550. This royal room was an apartment in its own right and its use varied depending on the time of day, becoming a bathroom, a bedroom or a reception room. In the back of the room, a door leads to the tribune of the chapel. In this way, the queen could hear the mass and follow it from her bed. The stained glass windows, also restored by the Princess of Broglie in the 19th century, relate the history of the different masters of Chaumont. Catherine de Medici never went anywhere without her astrologers, and she allocated a room to them. Nostradamus and Ruggieri who had as much power as a minister, succeeded each other here. Legend has it that this was the room where Ruggieri predicted to Catherine that none of the sons she had with Henry II would have children. Indeed, they all died young or without children, and her daughter married a certain Henry IV, who then became King of France. Even though the chateau is not royal, it nevertheless contains a council chamber. Here in this vast stateroom, many discussions and decisions resulted in political or economic agreements. Following a restoration in 2006, they discovered this decoration hidden behind the tapestries that date from 1852 and is from the owner who occupied the site before the Princess of Broglie. This council chamber was the room where Catherine exercised her power and is decorated with golden fleur-de-lis, the symbol of the French royalty. The tiling comes from Sicily 
The unique thing about it is that its colours were fired one after another to prevent them from mixing. So if we take a tile with five colours, that means it was fired five times in completely different manners. It was only much later, for 40 years at the end of the 19th century, that the chateau would once again experience a sumptuous era. Its new owners, the Prince and Princess of Broglie, who were passionate about the history of the site, would have many elements of the interior decoration and the exterior of the estate restored. The princess, who admired Catherine de Medici, regularly brought artists and intellectuals from Paris in her private train. She had parties and receptions and led a life of luxury. In this room, she held performances of shows by the Comédie Française and the Opera of Paris. She invited Sarah Bernhardt, Marcel Proust, and the composer Francis Poulain. In their salons, the prince and the princess received the greatest crowned figures of the world, as well as the greatest fortunes. At Chaumont, it was normal to meet Edward VII of England, Juan Carlos of Portugal, Queen Elizabeth II of Spain, Carlos I of Romania, the Shah of Iran, or the Maharaja of Punjab. At the time, the Chateau of Chaumont was really the centre of France. For its own comfort, the family installed central heating as well as running water and it was the first private estate to have electricity. Amongst these nearly royal decorations, there is a confidant with its helicoidal form, which was reserved for women. Two of them spoke and the other listened. After all this luxury, the princess sold the chateau in 1938 and the buyer, the state, ceded it back to the region. Now turned into a museum, today the chateau is a faithful reflection of the aristocratic life of Europe in the 19th and early 20th centuries. A strange perfume of the fantasy of the Broglie lingers on today and has taken hold in common areas and gardens of the estate. The management of the museum has implemented a contemporary scenography that recalls its former splendor. Nestled in its defensive Gothic architecture, embellished by the Renaissance and the extravagance of the Princesse de Broglie, the Chateau de chaumont sur loire seems to be on the forefront of creation, elegance and fantasy. It was recently added to the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Zibil Chaltun is a Mayan architectural site located in the Mexican state of Yucatan, 17 kilometers to the north of the state capital, Merida. Its name means place where there is writing on the stones. The site had been inhabited since the 6th century BC and it endured until the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. Zibil Chaltun reached its high point during the Mayan late classical period between the 7th and 10th centuries. Its population numbered in the tens of thousands, which made it one of the largest cities of ancient Mesoamerica. On the site, over 8,400 structures are distributed over an area of 20 square kilometers. The central area consists of numerous monumental structures considered masterpieces of Mayan art, with masonry and stones cut to measure. This expertise was then co-opted by the Spanish, who reused the perfectly cut materials to construct their own buildings, like this church that is now in ruins. This Catholic chapel was built by Franciscan missionaries during the 16th century, right in the middle of the central square of the site. The other major feature of Zibil Chaltun is its cenote. This freshwater sinkhole was certainly the center of a cult, and its crystal clear waters covered with water lilies sheltered archaeological treasures that have since been recuperated by divers. 
Among its structures, the city still has 12 sakbeob, or white roads, most of which begin at the center of the city and go out towards the periphery. Connected to the rest of the site by one of the Sakbeob, the Temple of the Seven Dolls is the most well-known structure of Zibel Shaltun. It was named that because of the seven small statues found there when the temple was discovered by archaeologists in the 1950s. Topped with a tower, it is a square temple with four symmetrical openings built on a monumental substructure. During the spring and autumn equinoxes on March 21st and September 21st, the rising sun shines directly onto one door and crosses through to the opposite opening. The plantings began on the spring equinox and the harvests on the autumn equinox. There is a museum on the site that contains Mayan objects found here and in the surrounding areas, including these zoo anthropomorphic statues of men with animal heads. Here, ball game players, the sacred Mayan game that often ended with the sacrifice of the loser. The museum houses relics as well as masks, painted pottery, various stelae, and carved stones and door lintels in excellent condition. Here, a magnificent Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. These treasures demonstrate, if it was necessary, the richness of this culture that was entirely devoted to nature and its benefits. In addition to its expertise in the fields of agriculture and architecture, Mayan civilization is also mainly known for its advances in the fields of writing, art, mathematics, and astronomy, not to mention the power of its spirituality. After having disappeared with the arrival of the Spanish, it is now one of the most studied pre-Columbian civilizations, along with the Aztecs and the Incas. And the museum retraces this cultural high point through various artifacts. But these cultural heights were reached due to material wealth, as Zibil Chaltun had grown rich thanks to the salt trade. The white gold was extracted nearby at the time, and the inhabitants traded it throughout the Mayan world. The city had become a business hub in the late Classic era. The University of Salamanca is the oldest university in the country and the fifth in Europe after Bologna, Paris, Oxford and Cambridge. Its origins go back to the schools of the old cathedral. The university itself was only built at the beginning of the 15th century. In the centre of the courtyard, a statue of Brother Louis de Leon, a monk who was a writer, poet and translator and taught theology and philosophy. At the time, there were 11 chairs specialised in canon law, civil law, medicine, logic, grammar and music. The title University indicates the diversity of the training given and the validity of its diplomas, as well as the fact that it's open to everyone. Minor schools and then later major ones were gradually created and some popes even favoured their development. 
after his return from the Americas, this is where Christopher Columbus presented his plan for an expedition to Asia in hopes of obtaining financial aid from the kingdom in place. Today, the buildings of the historic university and its oldest structures no longer contain classrooms, but only conference rooms and a museum. One of the classrooms is that of Brother Louis de Leon, whose statue is in the courtyard. It still has its original benches. The lecture hall resembles a courthouse. It contains tapestries by Goya. Naturally, the university has its own chapel in the purest Baroque style. The colonnade, which opens onto a small garden, is a place that is conducive to concentration. On the first floor, the old library of the university is simply stunning. Open since 1465, it was the first university library in the world. It holds more than 150,000 priceless books and documents. The colleges were the residences where the students lived in the Middle Ages. The emblems of the students who passed the exams were written on the walls of the courtyard. They were drawn with the blood of a bull that was sacrificed for the occasion. Inside, one can contemplate a beautiful ceiling painted by Fernando Gallego entitled The Sky of Salamanca. It depicts the signs of the zodiac and mythological elements. A courtyard surrounded by a colonnade like one in a cloister clearly shows the strong link that existed at the time between the church and the university, between religion and knowledge. A century later, in 1419, Las Duenas Convent was founded in the former palace of a rich financier. The main interest of the complex is certainly its magnificent cloister, which had to adapt itself to the layout of the original constructions. So it has an irregular, pentagonal form. Rising two stories high, its arches, columns, capitals and lintels were richly sculpted by an artist whose name now has been forgotten. The idea was to create a retirement home for the noble ladies of Salamanca. In this way, surrounded by Dominican nuns, they could end their days peacefully.
In the 18th century, an African nun lived here. She was captured in Africa at the age of 10. But because she was a princess, she was not made a slave. She was introduced to the king and even refused the marriage to a French prince. She preferred to be a servant at the convent until she could take her vows and end her days here, sheltered from the world that had broken apart her life. <laughs> 